be no exception. We are pleased to have a seasoned engineer, marketer, leader, writer, public speaker, and a pan-Africanist. And there are certain words that he uses a lot. Uh, shall I mention them? Neoliberal. <laughs> Magical thinking. Mindset revolution. Of course, I was with him in tech. In those days, he used to give lectures, but we will not go there. <laughs> when he is, and you know, I know something, when he is properly introduced, you will realize we have made a good choice. However, I must warn you to fasten your seat belts. You don't have any seat belts here, but if you get your loins, as the Bible will put it, and be attentive because I believe that, and I can bet that there will be no dull moment. Engineer Yao in Sakung, I'm looking forward to a slogan for today's delivery. Thank you all, and welcome again to today's lecture. Thank you. Uh, we're we putting our hands together for our president. <laughs> Engineer Kwabna Bimpong, thank you very much for welcoming us. I want to acknowledge the presence of the Executive Secretary of the Engineering Council of Ghana, Engineer Isaac Bedu. Our past Vice President, Engineer Theo Ni Okai. And then our past Vice President, Engineer Michael Kosi Levidede. I saw him somewhere. He has other names, he's not here, so I'll mention them. He used to be called Bolus, he was a bombardier, etc. So those who know, know. Next will be. Um, Inviting engineer, executive director, to introduce our chairman for today. I wish I was the one introducing her. You see, 40 years ago by now, she was my English mistress in Achimota School. <laughs> she taught me English, and she was my favorite teacher all time. I've written an article to that effect. Actually, on March 8th this year, on International Women's Day, I wrote an article. We were asked to write about people who are women who have inspired us. I wrote that she's one of the people who has inspired me to become what I am today. And a month later, she was, um, we saw the announcement that she had been nominated to become Chief Justice. All my classmates were sending me a message, and I was celebrating as if I had been made Chief Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Engineer, Engineer David Kweti Anyante, please come and introduce, do the introduction. Please, I wasn't doing the introduction. <laughs> President of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, Engineer Kwabna Bimpong, Chair, Professional Practice and Ethics, and President-elect of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, Engineer Ludwig Hesse, Council members, past presidents, representatives of professional bodies, distinguished invited guests, fellow engineering practitioners, the media, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to this highly anticipated event. It's an honor to introduce our esteemed chairperson for today, Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Saki Tokonu, whose law journey has been remarkable and extraordinary. Today's event centers on the theme improving national values, professional practice, and engineering ethics. We are here to explore the vital connections between law, ethics, and engineering practice with the goal of shaping up a brighter future for our nation and the world. Steering us on this journey is Her Leadership Justice Gertrude Saki Tokunu, our chairperson. Her Leadership 
graduated from the University of Ghana, Legon, with a BA in Law and Sociology in 1984. She was called to the bar in 1986. In 2001, she obtained a postgraduate diploma in international law and organization from the International Institute of Social Studies, which is part of Erasmus University, Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. In 2011, she graduated from Golden Gate University School of Law, USA, with a master's of law in intellectual property law. She had a secondary school ed education at Wesley Girls High School, where she obtained her ordinary level certificate, and at Chimota School for her advanced level certificate. She has had a distinguished and varied practice at the bar, including being a co-founder at Sozo Law Consult, where she worked as managing partner. In June 2004, Justice Gertrude Tokonu was elevated to the High Court bench and subsequently promoted in October 2012 to the Court of Appeal. In December 2019, she was elevated to the Supreme Court bench. She has occupied a number of positions since becoming a judge, prominent among them as supervising judge of commercial courts and chair of e-justice committee. Her leadership was nominated to the office of chief justice in April 2023 to replace his lordship justice Enin Yeboa, who retired on 24th May 2023. Her leadership justice, Gertrude Tokunu, is married with four daughters and three grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, let us embark on this voyage and in the spirit of unity and progress, strive to improve our national values, enhance professional practice, and embrace the ethical foundations that will guide us towards a brighter and more responsible future. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Help me to welcome our chairperson, Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Sakitokun. Good evening. Can you ladies in your seat? Thank you very much for the introduction. And please allow me to stand on existing protocols. The President, Ghana Institution of Engineering, the Executive Director, Ghana Institution of Engineering, members of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, past presidents, and somehow, um, I'm able to recognize virtually all of the past presidents as persons that I've been very close to. I, was, uh, I had a, this, the distinct honor of swearing in the first female president, Kalyan. <laughs> Distinguished and um, a speaker for tonight, who was also my student in Achimota School. <laughs> Distinguished invited guests, as much as it is a homecoming for me to spend the evening with you, it is also an honor and privilege to sit in the chair for this very important event. And let me tell you why it's a homecoming for me. If I have taught you in this room before, kindly wave. <laughs> Not just in secondary school, but in contract management. I've, then many of you are very young. <laughs> but very early in my career, I saw a notice in the lawyer's changing room 
the International Association, International Bar Association was inviting young lawyers with seven, less than seven years experience to apply for a scholarship to work anywhere in the UK, USA, or in Europe because they had, they had come to the position or the, the, the thinking that construction law was lacking in strong representation among the skills of lawyers. And so the International Bar Association was sponsoring, was ready to sponsor young, any young lawyer or a number of young lawyers to work in construction law departments or the engineering department or any of the uh, construction disciplines, the departments of the construction di disciplines in uh, a firm in UK, Europe, or America. And I recall being interested. I applied to do the scholarship, um, wrote, we entered the essay competition and eventually ended up winning it at the top of many, many, many people from many, many countries. <laughs> and that became my introduction to construction law. And so from my time in the at a, a top 20 law firm in the UK called Nabarro Nathanson, from there, I, when I returned to Ghana, some friend of mine, um, who was a contract or who is a contractor mentioned to the architects, the engineers, and said, This lady has expertise in construction law. And so, for many years of my legal practice, I spent them among engineers, the Institution of Engineers, and the Institute of Ar Architects, and um, doing programs for Department of Urban Roads, etc. And I became very comfortable among construction <laughs> experts. Eventually, I became a fellow of the Ghana Institution of, Eng of Construction. And I'm still um, invited to events. I'm, I feel very much at home in this building because I, I, I think it's, it's this very room. Yes. Um, when I became a judge, I had to, I, I, I resisted. For the, in my early years, and then after a while, I had to stop. <laughs> I just had to stop. So it feels like a homecoming for me. And I want to thank the Ghana Institution of Engineering, in particular the organizing committee responsible for this lecture, for the kind invitation to chair it. Let me also congratulate Engineer Yao Nsako, today's speaker, on his selection by the institution. Mr. Nsako is counted as one of the foremost thought leaders in today's communities, and I have no doubt that in him, we have a personality with a capacity and clarity of thought to properly address the topic presented, the topic presented and provide a framework within which relevant issues can be addressed for progress to be made in this really critical aspect of our national life. The theme for the lecture is most opposite. The subjects of values and ethics can never grow old. With the expansion of global community through the internet, the issue of morality has lost much of its sharp edge. Cultures and opinions ebb and flow, depending on the web location of a surfer, and it would seem that the broader the world view of a person, the more incoherent the conversation can get. The danger to national survival cannot be overestimated in this cacophony. There is a pressing imperative to my mind to restore an overview, at least, of national values and to re recognize the national good as greater than individual grasps and to make ethics a lodestar once again. That the institution has chosen the theme, improving national values, professional practice, and engineering ethics, quote unquote, I think is demonstrative of the fact that the profession recognizes its foundational role 
in the Republic. Engineers shape our infrastructure, propel technological advancements, and drive innovation. The engineer's role is pivotal to the progress and prosperity of the nation, as has been noted already this evening. Without an ethical anchor, the economy flails, breaks, or grows strong in the hands of its infrastructural infrastructure de developers. It is only fitting, then, that the professional body, as it is doing today, stimulates a national conversation on a matter that has always been critical to our well-being as a nation. Issues such as corruption, safety concerns, and adherence to codes of conduct have always dogged the pristine nobility of your profession. And I vow to myself that I would not say anything controversial. So I'm doing my best to be very, to behave like a guest. <laughs> but I've worked with you enough years to know this, what I mean by what, by what I just said. And so may I humbly repeat it. Issues such as corruption, safety concerns, and adherence to codes of conduct have always dogged the pristine nobility of your profession. As much as the Ghana Institution of Engineering has been instrumental in promoting engineering excellence and ethical practices, for which it is to be commended consistently, it has also been acknowledged that discussions on values and ethics are relevant within the context of how Ghana leaks so much money from the way infrastructure development is done. I look forward to a stimulating evening, and I invite you to do so, because I believe that Mr. Nsako is going to shake our foundations in many ways, even though I don't know how he's going to do it. <laughs> At this point, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Mr. Nsako. As I have, because that's, that's the second leg of my duty this evening. As I've already indicated, I had the joy of teaching him when he was only a boy. <laughs> Something he doesn't allow me to forget. He's a widely admired UK-based leader. And from his profile, we gather that from 1993, he has worked with Unilever in various roles spanning from marketing director and board member, strategic assistant to executive member, to executive member and president for Asia, managing director of Unilever East and Southern Africa, managing director and executive vice president, Unilever Ghana and Nigeria, and the executive vice president global markets. I asked him if he retired. And he said, yes, he took early retirement. He wasn't old enough to, re to, be, to be compulsorily retired. But he retired in 2023. And since then, I take it that early 2023, he's been extremely busy in various companies across Ghana, the United Kingdom, the USA, Shanghai, China. But you really live. <laughs> Currently, he's vice chairman and board member for Marketing Edge Brands and Advertising Excellence Awards Board Nigeria. He's board member, I don't know what NED is, non executive director and board member of the Brain and Mind Center, Ghana, and non executive director and board member of the Development Bank, Ghana. And board member of various organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, he's a young man, but he's done a lot. And he has focused on sharing his mind consistently with communities to shake all of us so that we can remain on the straight and narrow. It is really my privilege, it is really my joy to invite you to join me to welcome Mr. Yao Insako.
sit down. I, everybody stood up for me on that. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, hello, sir. <laughs> I've been asked to speak, as the, the theme has been repeated, on improving national values, professional practice, and engineering ethics. And I decided to present a paper titled, Every Day the Bucket Goes to the Well, One Day the Bottom Will Drop Out. Uh, to situate it within a context, I decided to take two quotes from China. Uh, the first is, never forget the well, drink the well diggers when drinking from the well, as from Xu and Lai, who used to be the premier of China. And the second is the chief purpose of mobilizing people's initiative is to develop the productive forces and raise living standards. That's from Deng Xiaoping. So now I get into the speech properly, and I just warn that I will speak a bit quickly because this, this is a big subject. There's a lot that I want to get through, and yet the chief justice is a very busy woman. So... If I'm not careful, she can throw me into jail if I go on too long. <laughs> so, so I want to speak quite quickly. Uh, so chairperson, senior engineers, I see several of them here, and all other engineers and professionals, citizens, not spectators, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to stand on existing protocols. I have deliberately left out spectators. It is immoral, unconscionable, and unacceptable in the times we live for any of our compatriots to be content to be a spectator. For the times, they are worrying. It is with great gratitude that I have come here to speak today, but I am not without a significant amount of trepidation as well. I forget that there's a difference in height between me and the Chief Justice. <laughs> I didn't say in whose favor. <laughs> it, is, it is with great gratitude that I have come here to speak today, but I am not without a significant amount of trepidation as well. I am grateful because when your colleagues select you out of millions of your compatriots to speak on such a subject, it is complimentary. While it is not hubristic to assume that being invited to give such a speech must mean you are at least not embarrassment, an embarrassment to the profession. That could be an exaggerated conclusion. Perhaps I could be here simply because they do not know me at all, and they are just about to realize a grievous mistake has been made. <laughs> Four, the institution made no effort to find out what I would be saying and gave me an absolutely free hand to prepare my remarks. What I say tonight, therefore, reflects only my views, not necessarily those of the Ghana Institution of Engineering. I do notice, though, that like all good engineers, the Ghana Institution of Engineering has installed a, a backup device. Should their own primary judgment fail, that of our chairperson tonight will not fail. She's the chief judge of the country. I mentioned that I was up here with some trepidation because while she is the Chief Justice of all of you, she is my Chief Justice, and as she said herself, she's also my beloved literature teacher, Trudy. <laughs> when she first met me, I was a 15, going on to 16-year-old Form 4 student in Achimota School. At the time, the only real reason I could find for being in school was that it would make my mother happy if I did well enough in the O-level examinations to do my sixth form, that is A-levels, at Achimota School. I really did think I was going to school as a favor to my mother at that time. The sitting Chief Justice was the very first person to teach me English literature as a subject. And what a devoted, doting teacher she was. I can only say thank you on behalf of the very many you touch so deeply, Trudy, our beloved Trudy. Silver and gold have we not, but in the name of all that is good about the human race, we thank you most sincerely. Having thanked you, Madam Chair, <laughs> my former teacher, Chief Justice, I am still in trepidation. You must disclose to me very quickly in which primary capacity you have come here. <laughs> Hopefully it is not as my former teacher here to assess whether I still remember anything you taught me. <laughs> For the worst thing that can happen to me is for the Chief Justice to rule that I have done nothing with all that she taught me. 
and then insist I must refund my school fees to those who inherited my late parents' estate at inflation-adjusted rates. That will be tough for me, for there is no court above the Supreme Court. <laughs> Many people, since her ladyship, our chair for tonight, was kind enough to write a post on my Facebook page and, simply, and sign simply and affectionately as Trudy, have asked all manner of questions. I'm told she has a reputation on the bench as a no-nonsense judge, stern, and a disciplinarian. Therefore, the questions put to me mainly seek to find out what the young, straight out of university Trudy was like. Answering some of them publicly may put me in contempt of the Supreme Court of Ghana. So I will not. But to the question that assumed, uh, amused me the most, I answer, yes, this Chief Justice can really dance. She was a dashing young teacher, universally adored by her students, especially the male students. <laughs> there is every likelihood that she is the best dancer that ever became Chief Justice in our country. <laughs> that is as far as I am willing to venture. Trudy, again, we thank you for everything. You are a special teacher. We wish you well in this very difficult job. Quick declarations. As always these days when I deliver a lecture like this, I must begin by snuffing out the frenzied flames of rumor. Yao Insako is not about to announce that he's contesting for any political office. I have no ambition whatsoever to participate in elective office, not now, not ever. I took this position in 1992 and it has not changed. Now we can move on. If you want to know why we get involved in the conversation when we are not running for office, I repeat to you the words of that profound thinker and freedom fighter, an icon of the anti-colonial liberation movements of Portuguese-speaking Africa, martyr of the struggle of freedom and dignity and more, Amilcar Lopez da Costa Cabral. He once observed with powerful but deeply sincere simplicity, and I quote, I am a simple African man doing my duty in my own country in the context of our time, end of quote. It does not take much to establish that we live in warring times in Ghana, in West Africa, and in much of Africa. The times, they are troubling. I will give only one figure, as we are going to be tight on time, for the enormity of the task involved in discussing this subject. The September Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana report put food inflation at 51.9%, 51.9%. There is no other way to describe this than that it is an explosive disaster. This would be so anywhere, for food prices rising that fast will challenge the harmony and social stability of any country on earth. We cannot afford to be complacent when things are in this space, and we are also heading to elections in, in 2024. Too many people in Ghana live in mass misery, too many people have nothing to lose. If those who have most to lose, the bourgeoisie, the upper classes, the ruling elites, just sit and watch the cracks, eventually the bottom of the market of society will drop out. It may not be a beautiful and controlled drop. If we do nothing now, which is already quite late, we could see a detonation. James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time could easily become our fire right here. This must become an urgent responsibility for us all. We cannot sit and simply be spectators as the society falls apart. We get involved because we are citizens, not because we have partisan political ambitions. We, citizens, fought for and secured this Fourth Republic of Ghana. The Fourth Republican Constitution, however imperfect it may have turned out to be in the hands of a predatory political class, was born dripping with blood, tears, and sweat. The blood of the many patriots who died in battle against military dictatorship, the tears of the martyrs, the victims of persecution by the Ghanaian Gestapo of that era, and their relatives and loved ones who lived in fear at what could happen. Of course, as well as the sweat of all those who still try to eke out an honest buck in this impossible economic set of circumstances that characterize our existence. In 30 years of the Fourth Republic, we have created a society in which seven out of ten 
of our compatriots live in poverty, having to get by on average family size budgets, and these family sizes are on average five, average some family size budgets of 140 Ghana cities a day. Five people, 140 Ghana cities a day. That is the average that is available to 70% of the population. It is a crime against humanity that we have allowed this to happen. As though this is not enough, we have also created a society in which our entire ecological system is now endangered by illegal mining, what we call galamse. We seem helpless as flora, fauna, water bodies, and the earth itself have become transmitters of death, morbidity, and poison. The tale of woe is long. About all I can say for this so-called democracy is that I can state even uncomplimentary facts about power before the Chief Justice and not risk liquidation or even arrest by the Ghanaian Gestapo. I concede that in this regard things are less bad, but I do not celebrate at this. We have created this mess and we must solve this mess. Or else what will we tell the ancestors when we are reunited? with them. That we just watch their toil and struggle dissipate as greedy and predatory neoliberal politicians squander the resources of the state and impoverish the masses further. Between 2000 and 2022, according to Afrobarometer, public approval of democracy has dropped by a whopping 1,200 basis points in this country. Read into that what you want, but it is a very worrying trend. Ladies and gentlemen, what will we say when we meet Professor Kojo Dubois in Kontopiat, Professor P. A. Viansa, Professor Kwame Jechi, Christian Apiaje, B.J. Darocha, Justice Amwasechi, Peter Alajete, and many of our ancestors who fought with their all to secure this dispensation? It is a very scary thought. What will we tell them when we also arrive at the land beyond the river? In his powerfully rendered essay, Discourse on Colonialism, Aimé Césaire begins on a thundering note of condemnation of European colonialism. I borrow it with a, a very slight modification to fit our fourth republican context. It should cause deep reflection for all of us who live with the deterioration of everything, especially of values, principles, and ethics, that the fourth republic has come to represent the state of anomie. Modified for the context, Aimé Cizé's famous opening paragraph would read to Ghanaians us, a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization. A civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization. A civilization that uses its principles for trickery and deceit is a dying civilization. The fact is that the so-called Fourth Republic of Ghana, as it has been shaped by three decades of bourgeois rule, is incapable of solving the two major problems to which its existence has given rise. The problem of mass misery and the anomi problem. That the ruling elite is unable to justify itself before the bar of reason or before the bar of conscience. And that, increasingly, it takes refuge in a hypocrisy which is all the more odious because it is less and less likely to deceive. Fighting and ominous words. Therefore, we, all of us, must solve our problems or else we die. The bottom will drop out. A night of orature, back to Dunia Cinema and Hotel Kumbaya in Nima, Accra. I was asked for a slogan, huh? <laughs> As many know, I do not like to deliver lectures of over 45 minutes alone. Persuaded by the efficacy of the orator technique in our endogenous systems of communication, I prefer orator to the monologue lecture mode. It is worth saying that the writings of the late stalwart Pan-Africanist scholar, Professor Michel Remugo, convinced me the most on this. To properly set up a night of orator, I must go back to our heritage and rich traditions of storytelling. So here goes. Adunia Cinema in Nima where Chuck Norris was the king of kings and star celebrity, not all were as fortunate as our now highly reputed psychologist Nortedria and his friend Danjuma Wangyu. 
Norte and Danjuma had the funds to pay the entrance fee to enter and see the film. Many others did not, for in those days and even now, Nima was home to many who merely survived rather than thrived. When any Chuck Norris movie ended, there would be a crowd of expectant youth waiting to hear about the latest exploits of their star and, celebra and celebrity, the revered Chuck Norris, the man they fondly called Chuku Norris. This expected cr expectant crowd would shout as soon as they saw the film goers exist, asking how the great Chuku Norris had managed to liquidate and stampede, and stampede the bad guys this time. For Chuku Norris was known indeed to stampede his enemies to death. In response to this question, the privileged film goers like Nortedua, my good friend, would be ready. They too would scream back to their excited audience, Ha! Chuku Norris in now stampede. <laughs> and the now frenzied crowd, eager to hear more, would part ask and part say, hoping for more details. Nah, serious. <laughs> Almost with rhythmic choral orchestration, the spaces between Dunia Cinema and Hotel Kumbaya would then be filled with equally reverberating chants. In na stampidi, na serious, na stampidi, na serious, na stampidi, na serious. I suspect those of you familiar with oracha techniques have figured out already that this is going to be our chant tonight. We will give this speech together. When I say na stampidi, I want you to bring the roof down by screaming louder than the crowd at Dunia Cinema. Na serious. There will be no tolerance of bourgeois stiffness. Even her ladyship will join us. For, for she does what her favorite student wants, so long as it keeps him focused on his work. That is the way it always was, and that is the way it is going to be. At least that is my version, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so shall we try the chant? Na stampidi! Na Na stampidi! Okay, let's go. <laughs> now let us get on with what we are here for, discussing under the theme Improving National Values, Professional Practice, and Engineering Ethics, a paper titled with inspiration from one of the biggest global superstars, to ever have graced the surface of this earth, the revolutionary reggae singer, Robert Nesta Marley, every day the bucket goes to the well, one day the bottom will drop out. A short stop to deal with definitions. As you know, I am no academic, I am an area boy. Therefore, I will not be detained by detailed explanations and definitions. I am incapable of doing so. Yet, it is important that we establish uniformity of understanding of what we are discussing. Let us begin with some views of academics who also happen to be professionals. The book, Values and Ethics in Coaching, written by three leading scholars on the subject of professional ethics, Professor Iona Iordanu, Rachel Hawley, and Christiana Iordanu, is very highly regarded by many. The foreword to the book is written by Professor David Clutterbuck, in my view, one of the most respected voices in the world in the, world of in the worlds of leadership and coaching. A few quotes from this book should do for our purposes today. Quote one, values are defined as principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. Quote two, ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. Quote three, the ethical prism weighs the dimensions of the personal, institutional, social, and political factors. And the last and fourth quote from the book, values and ethics sit hand in hand. I repeat that, values and ethics sit hand in hand. The academic literature on ethics and values is of course heavily influenced and perhaps even subordinate to work done on moral philosophy. It is only fitting, therefore, that I provide a bridge between these definitions trained mainly on the professional context and philosophy. By quoting Henry Foucault, when he writes, and I quote, every society has its own regime of truth, its general politics of truth, end of quote. The question for us to ponder is, what is the politics of truth that the Fourth Republic has engendered? A pure rhetoric of power or an opportunistic, misleading, and highly disingenuous use of communication techniques 
for the most transactional and manipulative purposes, only meant to secure electoral victory. Professor Kwame Jechi, for those of us who were fortunate to know him, a very modest man, but by any criteria, one of the most influential philosophers from Africa in the post-colonial era, once made the following telling comment, and I quote, the African worldview is essentially a moral one in which the ethical dimension is central, end of quote. In that statement, the incomparable Kwame Jechi shows again that positive considerations about values and ethics are indigenous to Africa. Those were not imported. Therefore, the derailment and sham consequences of neoliberal democracy cannot stem from any uniquely African characteristics. They arise from primeval tendencies toward greed and predatory acquisitiveness by our elites, Andre Gunda Franks, the Lumpen bourgeoisie. We shall now turn our attention, having briefly established definitional clarity, to whether Ghana has a problem with ethics and values at all. I think we do, but let us see. Nas Tampidi. <laughs> the moral dilemma of neoliberal capitalism and some of its fallouts. There is enough in the headlines every day to keep us chattering about the latest rapacious deed and plain brigandage of someone in political office. This does not stop whether it is the MPP or NDC in power. It is deeply disturbing to see this happen with such alarming frequency for it conditions the minds of the masses. It sometimes appears as though having filled every other space with their loot, politicians have taken to hiding it in cupboards, under beds, in wardrobes, and maybe soon even in chamber pots. Not so long ago, it was the current president, Nana Kufuado, mocking the then attorney general of an NDC government, Dr. Obed Asamoa. The newspaper headlines had alleged that one of Obed's domestic workers had stolen money from a stash under his bed or in a cupboard. Akufuado shot back at his John Kugler New Memorial Lecture. Mr. Chairman, what a theft. Mr. Chairman, what a cupboard. <laughs> and we clapped. If recent news reports are to be believed, then following the adage one good turn deserves another, the cupboard seems to have reappeared in the era of the MPP too. But this time, it was greeted with relative silence, not an Akufuado exclamation about the nature of the cupboard. The Fourth Republic has spawned many big and unaccountable men. Before our eyes, we see a search for political favors, for contracts, for public procurement deals, and for appointments result in massive corrosion of meritocracy. It precipitates moral degeneracy. The unaccountable big man, to whom no one dare say anything critical, is incompatible with true democracy. In 1980, when the reforms he is generally credited to have been the architect of were just rarely taking off, Deng Xiaoping, in my view, the most historically and economically significant leader the human race has ever encountered, for his reforms took 800 million people out of poverty, warned that he would deal with such behavior with an iron hand. He cautioned, and I'll quote a little bit at length, the most senior members of his party in chilling but humorous words. I quote him, during the Cultural Revolution, this is Deng speaking, when someone got to the top, even his dogs and chickens got there too. Likewise, when someone got into trouble, even the distant relatives were dragged down with him. This situation became very serious. Even now, the abominable practice of appointing people through favoritism and factionalism continues unchecked in some regions, departments, and units. There are quite a few instances where cadres abuse their power so as to enable their friends and relations to move to the cities or to obtain jobs or promotions. It is thus clear that the residual influences of clannishness must not be underestimated. We need to exert ourselves if these problems are to be solved." End of quote. There must be lessons in those words for our own experience in Ghana. But if Deng Xiaoping was speaking about Fourth Republican Ghana, he may have had to say, that when someone gets to the top, even his dogs, chickens, and side chicks get to the top too. <laughs> now, <Nas, tampidi. laughs> Such conspicuous excess and abuse of office leads to a knock in confidence of the democratic process. It can eventually lead to explosive consequences, part of the proverbial bottom 
dropping out. Egregious inequality, meaning inequality that leaves the majority in mass misery, is the chief driver of social instability. It is also the lead consequence of neoliberalism. The system no doubt triggers capital accumulation, but it is deeply oriented to overconcentration and poor distribution, and there it enters a death trap. The Oxfam World Inequality Report 2022 states ominously that, and I quote, the richest 1% of the global population bagged 82% of the generated of the wealth generated last year. You heard that right. The richest 1% of the global population bagged 82% of the wealth generated last year. In contrast, the poorest half of humanity saw no increase in their wealth. The report also highlights that the top 10% of the global population own 76% of all wealth, while the poorest half of the population owns only 2% of the total. Poorest half, only 2% of the total. This inequality is driven by factors such as tax evasion, erosion of workers' rights, cost-cutting, and firms' influence on policy. The report calls for governments to ensure that economies work for everyone and not just a fortunate few. End of quote. According to the World Hunger Statistics 2020 by Food Aid Foundation, 821 million people, or one in nine, still go to bed on an empty stomach each night. Even more, one in three suffer from some form of malnutrition. The Global Report on Food Crisis 2022, remember one in nine go to bed with no food, hungry. The Global Report on Food Crisis 2022 by the Global Network Against Food Crisis then reveals that more than 900 million tons of food is thrown away every year. In a world in which one in nine go to bed hungry, we throw away more than 900 million tons. With 17% of the food available to consumers going directly into the bin. Of this waste, 60% is in the home. So it's not post-harvest losses. 60% is in the home. We throw away the food. The global economic system with its dominant courage, neoliberal capitalism, is in serious trouble. This, the system is broken if these are its outcomes. I would say the system is even dangerous if these are its outcomes. As my friends in East Africa will say in Swahili, neoliberal capitalism is the scourge of modern humanity, kabisa, the chief ethical issue of the human race in the 21st century. I do not know about you, but I was particularly rattled by the 2020 Oxfam World Inequality Report. With the world in the throes of COVID and rattled to an existential extent, millions of workers were laid off in all kinds of schemes. Business said this was necessary to protect its collective model, and therefore these mass layoffs were essential for the very survival of capitalism. Then here came this report saying the net wealth of the world's billionaires increased by 30% during the, six, the first six months of the coronavirus pandemic. Wealth inequality is nothing new, but even for people like me who have no issue whatsoever with people getting rich from their honest labor, we must concede something is wrong. The insensitivity and callousness that sends hundreds of millions of people away from work and dignity, while a few disproportionately increase their colossal wealth, is simply put spiritual wickedness. The Oxfam report found that, listen to this carefully, that the world's 2,153 billionaires had more wealth than that of 4.6 billion people combined meaning they were wealthier than 60% of the Earth's entire population combined. The Oxfam report also estimated, wait for this, and remember that the Chief Justice is also an African woman when I say this, that the world's 22 richest men have more wealth than all the women in Africa combined. 22 richest men have more wealth than all the African women combined, and there are African billionaires who are women. So you would strip them out and then you see what the reality with the majority is. The report says women and girls who spend billions of hours cooking, cleaning, and caring for children and the elderly are the backbone of our global economy, yet benefit the least from it. 
Paul O'Brien, Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Oxfam America, said in a release about the report, he continues, it's no accident that while most billionaires are men, women handle the care work and dominate the least secure and lowest paid jobs. Women and girls are subsidizing our sexist economies, enabling rich, white, male billionaires to accumulate vast fortunes at the expense of the poorest. End of quote. To me, this is the number one moral, ethical, values, and philosophical crisis facing humanity in the 21st century. The fact that so many languish in mass misery in a world that also has so much wealth and yet cannot distribute it properly because a few must hoard to satisfy their greed. This dark reality of mass poverty and its associated indignities are the biggest threat to humanity. They make the world an unstable place. The wonder is why policy addiction to the directions that produce such out outcomes continue to be favored to the point of mindless addiction by so many in Africa. Ghana is no exception, and we are witnessing the evidence. As a chemical engineer, I know that the laws of osmosis and thermodynamics both drive natural corrections when one side has too much and the other has too little. The second law of thermodynamics indeed argues that the total energy in a closed system remains con constant. Yet, neoliberals have built an economic model in which over-concentration of wealth, extreme income polarization takes place and dangerously leaves out many from the fruits of development. We know from our engineering practice that a system that has no self-correcting mechanism to ensure fair distribution soon explodes. Is our fourth republic heading there? As some of the rich politicians on both sides of the duopoly watch mass misery in our midst and yet continue to grab with both hands, their mouths, their feet, everything they can use to stash away under beds, in cupboards and wardrobes, under mattresses and wherever else. In Nigeria, people even hid money in polytank water tanks and buried them. Predatory acquisitiveness can make people mad, it seems. How can you bury dollars in a polytank and then you forget? So someone else went and found, went and found the pot. He had so much money, he had forgotten there was a full tank of dollars that he had buried. The great MS is there, thundered at European co colonialism in 1915. His book earlier referred to the immortal words that almost grew to become one of the most used slogans of the anti-colonial movements globally. Colonialism, I'm quoting M.A. Césaire, equals thingification. To make a people an object, to make its culture an object, is a fundamentally dehumanizing process. End of quote. I will again modify Césaire's immortal words for our context. Neoliberalism equals thingification. I promise somebody that I will not make too much noise about VRA today, but I will only say that when we engineers get to a place where they can say to people, we told you to move and we did not move, so we have drowned you, those people have been thingified. I, I am willing to take an oath that that could never have been done in cantonments. But the people of Mipe have been thingified. So we do these things and we, and we just move on. But I made a promise, so I'll try to keep to it. That is the only explanation I can give for one human being sending another out of a job when his, and it is usually his, own wealth is growing by 30%. Why do you send somebody home so that they don't have a salary, they can't eat, they can't take care of their family, and your wealth is growing by 30%? What, what are you trying to improve the margins for? How else can I explain that we do nothing about illegal mining, Galam say, poisoning our compatriots? Would we be so quiet and indifferent if we had to drink polluted water in Laboni, cantonments, airport, residential area, ridge, and so on? It can only be fully explained by accepting that we see some of our compatriots as less human than us. Therefore, we simply do not care enough about their conditions of existence, and that is thingification. Fourth Republican politics has led to thingification of the poor electorate. They are viewed as thumbprints on a ballot paper, no more. Else, how in God's almighty name can we live unconcerned, undisturbed, and unperturbed when the April Partners Report published such dark realities in June 2023 about poverty in this country and drew attention to such stark and disturbing statistics? 
Na stampidi. There is a fire on the mountain. I organized, I agonized about how to approach this subject. Was I to focus on spectacular individual failings or in the relatively short time available, should I tackle systemic root causes? They say the problem is us, Ghanaians, and our ways. If only we could change our bad behavior, everything would be heavenly. I find it frustrating, even irritating, to hear politicians on both sides make this argument as they are bid to abdicate leadership responsibility. Who on earth do they think they are going to lead when they come campaigning for votes? Cats and dogs? It is us, Ghanaians. So why do they fight so hard to lead us and then turn around to say they are unsuccessful in office because of us? This is how we were when they were when they, the politicians, were in opposition and pleading for a chance to lead us, we have not changed. And getting office in Ghana means you will lead Ghanaians, not people from Antarctica. This sterile plea must stop or be halted by we, the people. In the As fate would have it, I watched a lecture by the outstanding Ugandan political scientist, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, in discussing one of his many influential books, he made a critique of the Nuremberg trial model. The Nuremberg model has been adopted by many nations that emerged from crisis since the end of World War II. Professor Mamdani argued convincingly, in my view, that an overfocus on individual perpetrators can lead to a de- the emphasis of actual systemic root causes that need to be addressed. Then, then, I knew I was going to focus more on systemic root causes of our national condition in the Fourth Republic than on individual actors. Thirty years on, one of the sad and inescapable conclusions of our neoliberal democratic journey is that when in power, the two parties and their lead politicians are not that different. Corruption has remained a big issue both under NDC and MPP governments, despite what their leaders say on campaign platforms. As for us, the hapless masses, we console ourselves by saying helplessly in Pidgin English, country broke or country no broke, we day inside. Now, stampede. My boss and big brother, Paul Pullman, never stopped saying to us that we must work on the forest and not in the forest. It is easy to get lost in the weeds and think you are making progress, but the real opportunity is to make structural and fundamental changes to the entire ecosystem. This is also the lesson, and I see that some of them are here, that I learned from the senior engineers who trained me at Unilever. People like our own Avancula Inspira, Andrew Kwesin, who I'm so grateful to see here, like the indomitable and unshakable Kwame (laughs) Adai, who is signaling me to keep quiet. I was just going to point to him. I wouldn't do that. But look at the man who is laughing the most. (laughs) <laughs> and of course, Benenye J. Pamela Abatex and Kofi Folsin and the late Emmanuel Agana. Emmanuel Agana in particular mentored me, sad that he died so early. Especially in accident reporting, focus was always on how we were going to fix the fundamental root causes, not symptoms. Any number of the quality gurus will tell you this for free. From W. Edwards Deming, I mean, with an engineering crowd, so I, I think you know these names. And Joseph Duran, through to Kaoru Ishikawa, Genichi Taguchi, and Akio Morita, to Philip Crosby, Shigeo Shingo, and many more. Of course, to me, the greatest quality master of all time is my first manager, Joseph Tusa, the formidable biochemist who took me under his wings when I joined Unilever as a national serviceman. God bless all my bosses. I will keep fidelity with that training, therefore, and focus on systemic matters, Before doing so, though, it is worth establishing that we do have a major crisis of ethics and values in this country with some simple illustrations. The Ghana Integrity of Public Services Survey, GIPSS, is a survey conducted by the Ghana Statistical Service in partnership with the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC. This survey aims to provide internationally comparable measures of corruption and support the implementation of policies to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 16, which seeks to substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. 
The 2021 Made in Ghana Integrity of Public Services Survey report, which was launched on July 21st, 2022, revealed that almost 5 billion CDs was paid in cash as bribes to public officials last year. 5 billion. The report also indicated that 9 out of 10 bribes were paid in cash. You heard that right, cash. Any wonder beds, wardrobes, chamber pots, and cupboards are now hiding unholy stashes of loot. They demand money for favors in the public sector, and they want it in cash. Because go electronic, and you may be hauled before her ladyship, the Chief Justice, to explain the transaction trail. In fact, this week, those of you who follow the story would have seen somebody who is trying to become an MP for one of the political parties saying not only did he have cash, he said he has dollar. He would do better than his contestant because he has top dollar. It's not a CD that he's going to get. He's bragging about this to, to the media. To facilitate such evil flows of funds, our political elites have created a dense and opaque climate for the movement of huge amounts of money so their footsteps, dripping with ill-gotten wealth, cannot be tracked. The pointers to this are many, and I will not dwell on them, but study the Auditor General's report, annual reports, the perception studies of Afrobarometer, the Global Financial Secrecy Index, and many more. Sadly, they point to the same trend. That we may still apply Professor Kofi Awono's expression when he described the Supreme Military Council of General Kutu Achampon. The Fourth Republic seems to have collapsed into an elite compromise that has supervised an era of organized thuggery and brigandage. Now, nah, stampede! Nah, the rise of anomic conditions and non beneficial culture. Amilcar Cabral was right when he described freedom itself as first and foremost an act of culture. So is political corruption and the attendant collapse of values and ethics. I hasten to add that I see culture as a consequence of deliberate choices, of acts of omission and acts of commission. Culture is not genetic. It is learned behavior, first as individuals and then at scale as society. Therefore, with courageous and determined leadership, culture can be made wholesome. That is an inescapable lesson from history. Wherever the rule of law is established and respected and enforced by competent states, Culture shapes up. Unfortunately, neoliberalism preaches retrenchment of states, with the result that we end up with incompetent states that cannot enforce their own good laws. Which law in this world that has helped other societies move forward do we not have on our books in Ghana? Yet we cannot enforce them. So we are saddled with the dangers of illegal mining, haphazard building practices, chronic noise pollution, indiscriminately train feudal land grabbing practices, open defecation at higher levels than we should tolerate, burglary, indiscipline on our roads, leading to unacceptably high fatalities, official corruption, now as you had even official drowning of people, and much more that is simply contemptible. For which of these do we not have laws? Yet the anomie beat goes on. When people begin to realize there is no certain consequence for breaking the law, they take liberties with it. Incompetent states breed Robinson Crusoe societies. Therefore, and in Robinson Crusoe societies, you soon get Santa Claus democracies like we have now. The politicians show up once every four years bearing gifts like Santa Claus at Christmas for the populace. Sometimes I'm told the gifts even include the traditional tool for administering enema, what is known in the local parlance as bantua. When people are willing to give their votes for bantua, they are also saying in their own way that they have lost confidence in the politics of the elite. For they do not behave in the same way when it comes to selection of their paramount chiefs. Unsurprisingly, dangerous deviations begin to show up in the space of the moral culture of the people. I will illustrate with a few anecdotes and sayings that are common in Ghana. No doubt many of these sayings were originally well-intentioned. But the fish rots from the head. When a people see their leaders knee-deep in corruption, the debasement spreads like a cancer. Anomic conditions, the collapse of values in society, are unfortunately very contagious. As part of my effort to make my hero, good old Professor Ngugi Watyonga, a bit happy, 
I will not be translating any of these rep renditions of street sayings that I make in local languages. So if you can't speak the language, you look to somebody in the crowd and they'll interpret it for you. People steal in plain sight and parade high society showing off ill-gotten wealth, as if to say like the account song, me a branti a cigarette simano. Me bo me walkings. Cigarette simano. You know that song? Me a branti a cigarette simano. <laughs> oh, be a branti a. Baby, I am the control. Oh. <laughs> me bo me walkings. <laughs> we used to be a people. Prime Headlines is brought to you by Don't take risks. Use a condom every time. And thanks to Malatu, I kicked out Malaya one time. Some spices. Yes, sir. So just gone by a while ago is uh, Engineer Yaron Sarko's lecture on ethics and leadership. Now time for us to bring you Joy News Prime live on DSTV channel 421. Go TV channel 125. This is Joy News Prime with me, Samuel Kojo Brace. Coming up, the MPP's presidential primary reaches a home stretch. Latest polls places Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia in the lead, but brings to the fore his dwindling fortunes, giving him a mere 43.5% lead with his main contender securing 23.5%. Details from the Global Info Analytics polls, which is predicting a possible runoff with none of the candidates securing a 50 plus one vote. Now, former Energy Minister Boache Jaco fights back accusations of wrongdoing in the Trafigura dispute, maintains he acted on cabinet recommendation in power purchase deal abrogation leading to a $140 million judgment debt. At 8 p.m., I hand over to Paus Kojo Baka to bring us prime business. Ghana places 10th in Africa with the largest foreign direct investments between 2021 and 2022. Later at 8.30, Wazak Uzba will be coming up with Prime Sports. Well, we'll bring you a comprehensive build-up to the commencement of the Women's Premier League expected to kick off on Saturday. We're home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Please stay for details. Joy News Prime Headlines was brought to you by... Don't take risks. Use a condom every time. And thanks to Malatu, I kicked out Malaya one time. Some spices. Yes, sir. Our fair delegate has become a popular statement during internal party elections in Ghana. It is believed that delegates are influenced in several ways in their voting decisions leading to the disappointment of some candidate. In today's episode of the Fear Delegate series, Nana Bwache Yadom interacts with some delegates in the Echima Mwabiaja North constituency in the Asante region ahead of the MPP's presidential primary. <laughs> I will not say fear delegates, fear human beings, because the delegates haven't come from a different planet. The delegates are all human beings, some are even my relatives. For all you know, you, even the interviewer, you are also a delegate, so I could also be afraid of you.
So come November 4th, delegates across the country will be going to their various polling stations to elect a flag bearer for the new patriotic party going into the 2024 general elections. But let's get interactive with some of these delegates from the Achuman Wabeja North constituency. Fear delegates, they say, but is that still the case? Openi, Sir John, say fear delegates. O can you make them? Is that so? Yeah, Juma. Yeah, also many people tell me. Me say, Omo ambaya was ambaya yo 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 yo. And I say, you want peace in the baby? Call echo premises. Now delegates fully need to chi. Ebi ebi ako tono na. Ebi ebi ako tono. You want special be nyano kono. O o o anya sa. Anti fear delegates in the air. Ewo ho e ye Juma. E be ye Juma ako premises yesu beba. How they see the be ye Juma ako premises yesu beba. If you say him, say Mirko, then him no na niye mebi isesa. Niye mebi isesa. Then niye mebi isesa. Then they say, eh, Ebia, the bema niye masesa kakrao delegate in Uno say, Ebia the bedroom bebi na inipa waso omotwa bana. 